So it's been a challenging uh, few years, and, uh, and something that we're really proud of is that we managed to keep our research going through the pandemic, uh, and our CIRA staff well, continue we to work on our goal of reducing the blindness in the, in the world, and, and ideally uh, helping to achieve a world that's free of vision loss and blindness. So, so on that note, here's a short video about some of the work that we've been doing through the pandemic. Well, we work in a fantastic... Well, we work in a fantastic field and, and we're at a really exciting time in eye research because building on some of the knowledge that we've gained about how the eye works over the years, we're now starting to turn that into treatments for conditions that were never previously treatable. For dry macular degeneration where cells are dying, we currently have no treatment. But I think we're on the cusp very much of having treatments, not only once you get cell death slowing it down, but hopefully through our work and that of others, having an intervention that can slow people once they've identified with having the early stages of the disease. Uh, at the start of my career, inherited retinal diseases, we, we just told patients that there was nothing that we could do. We now have new and exciting treatments. So, so our field never stays still. Some of the significant progress that I've seen us make over the last 10 years includes the development of a potentially promising first intervention for the early stages of macular degeneration. I hope in the next 10 years that we will also develop new diagnostics and better ways of detecting, predicting the progression of glaucoma so that we can intervene at an earlier stage before someone loses the vision. The artificial intelligence can replace a lot of work that has been re previously done by human beings. We were working on the prediction. For example, what's your likelihood of having the progression of eye disease? Now we could use genetic tool to form a, a type of therapy that potentially could actually slow down or even cure those of disease. So I think my, my, my hope is that in the future, so we could have a solution for each of eye disease and then just prevent the, the vision loss. One of the most devastating aspects that I find from talking to people with inherited retinal diseases who are losing vision is not just the concept that you're not able to see, but actually the concept that you're not able to see as well as before. It's not knowing whether or not you're going to be able to see your children grow up. It's not being able to see your wives or husbands as you grow old together. And that's a very big part of why I love doing what I do. CIRA is actually one of the leading sites for a world first trial looking at a treatment potentially for retinitis pigmentosa. We have kept our, our research going, our clinical research, our lab based research, the whole way through the pandemic and now that we're coming out the other side of that, we're starting to expand and to grow. So we've got some pretty exciting uh, opportunities to build on the success we have as the largest clinical trial centre for vision and eye research in Australia and, and make ourselves even more um, capable into the future so that we can help bring new therapies to, to patients. So I hope that gives you a, a little bit of a flavour of some of the work that we have going on. And I'd just like to give a shout out to uh, colleagues from Syria who are here today, some of whom were shown in the video and some, some weren't, uh, who continue to work tirelessly day in, day out uh, through the pandemic and, uh, and beyond uh, to allow us to develop some of the new research uh, that we are going to present to you today. So, so I'd like to move on to present uh, or introduce you to some of our presenters today. So, so first you're going to hear from Professor Robin Geimer. Uh, Robin is one of CIRA's deputy directors and the head of our macular research unit and she's currently investigating new treatments for macular degeneration across the spectrum um, but is particularly interested in the early stages of AMD and, and developing novel uh, imaging techniques and, and, and novel endpoints for clinical trials. Uh, Robin became an AM in the 2018 uh, Queen's Birthday Honours List, uh, recognising her contribution to medicine in general and ophthalmology in, in particular uh, in the field of macular degeneration. Uh, you'll also hear from uh, Associate Professor Lindell Lim, who's going to join us a little bit later on. And uh, Lindell is head of our clinical trials unit, and her main interests are in uveitis and ocular immunology uh, and diabetic retinopathy. And her team run a variety of different clinical trials, and you'll hear some of that work today. 
And finally, I'd like to introduce you uh, and also hand over to um, my uh, colleague, Associate Professor Peter Van Weingarten. So Peter is uh, another of CIRA's Deputy Directors and our Principal Investigator for Ophthalmic Neuroscience. And uh, he's doing some really exciting work developing new ways of imaging the eye to detect uh, the early signs of eye disease, but also other diseases like Alzheimer's disease and other, other conditions. So some really exciting work that you're going to hear about today as well. And Peter also has a keen interest in diabetic eye disease and is a clinical director for KeepSight, which is a national program for diabetic retinopathy uh, screening. Um, we have very strong links with the uh, diabetic community and, and great to see uh, representation here uh, today as well from, uh, from Diabetes Australia. So thanks again for everyone who's uh, attended today. And, and Peter, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Keith, and uh, welcome, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to see you all in person. Uh, Rearing um, Keith's earlier statement, you know, it wasn't an easy decision to postpone our, our um, community forum, um, but nature conspired against us, as uh, seems to have been the case in the last couple of years. Um, so we made quite a difficult decision, um, given that we, we weren't sure whether the storm front would be hitting um, the CBD. And uh, in retrospect, seeing the, the damage that um, the storms caused out west, um, you know, we made the right call. So apologies for any inconvenience, but uh, great to see the stalwarts here today. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to what I think will be a very um, inspiring and informative um, session today. So we're delighted to be able to host you today at Melbourne Museum. Um, it's a place of wonder and discovery, and I think it's just perfectly apt for the mission of CIRA. We're all about wonder and discovery for purpose, and that is to um, end needless vision loss. Um, just before we go on, I'd like to just run through some general housekeeping. Um, the toilets are located um, out in the foyer, at the back end of the foyer. So when you leave the auditorium, just turn right. Um, in the unlikely event of an emergency, we'll ask you to follow the directions of Melbourne Museum staff. So we're extremely grateful to the museum for their hospitality today, and we're thrilled to be able to extend the hospitality further. Um, you'll all be um, able to have complimentary access to the museum and all the amazing exhibitions, um, including the Triceratops exhibition. So the, the child in you will, will revel in, in, in that. So please avail yourself to that. It's meant to be phenomenal. Um, so we're going to welcome your questions. We love interaction, um, but uh, we'll ask you to sort of keep a lid on it until the end. Oh, there'll be a Q&A session, and we'll be um, delighted to um, field your questions. Um, and we'll have Matt and Callum walking uh, with roving microphones. Uh, we'll also welcome you to come and speak with us during lunch. that will follow the, um, the proceedings. Um, but please do be mindful that we can't provide personal medical advice um, and we'd always encourage you to speak to your healthcare professional. Um, it's my great pleasure now to um, hand you over to my dear colleague, um, Professor Robin Geimer, um, who's going to be discussing what's new in age-related macular degeneration for our first presentation. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Peter and Keith, and my welcome as well. I do have slides, but I do recognise that there are many in the audience who perhaps cannot see them, so I'll try and uh, describe uh, as we go along what I'm talking about. But it's a great pleasure just to give you a little overview of uh, where we are with age-related macular degeneration, or AMD. It is the most common cause of poor vision in people over 50, which unfortunately is many of us in this audience. Um, and so very important that we stay abreast of, of what's happening. And so I'm just going to touch on uh, what we call wet AMD and tell you about uh, uh, what should be very soon a new treatment for that disease in our hands and then look at the dry AMD and then um, look at perhaps what we do more in, in my research is trying to prevent people getting to those vision-threatening late stages of AMD by seeing how we can uh, slow the progression um, once one is diagnosed with the disease. So before we start, I want everyone to be on the same page when I use words uh, wet and dry and, and et cetera in terms of AMD. So this slide, for those of you who can see it, identifies different stages of AMD. So when you 
often have no symptoms at all and attend for glasses at the optometrist or have a family history and want to be checked, you'll be told that you have uh, some deposits at the back of your eye. And depending on the size of those, you may either have what's called early or intermediate AMD. And those terms really relate to a risk of progression to vision-threatening AMD. They in themselves, it's sort of like finding blood pressure, which gives you a risk of a stroke or a heart attack. You don't currently have any symptoms, but, but you are identified at risk. So this really is just talking about having identified that you are at greater risk than the general population of running into trouble down the track. And the trouble that you can run into is called late AMD, of which there are two types. Wet means a bleeding form of the disease, which is shown here down the bottom. So you get either blood or fluid leaking out into the retina, which is not a good idea. If you think of your retina like the film in the camera, you want that to be crisp and sharp and clean. You don't want blotches of uh, fluid or blood on it. And so that's wet macular degeneration. Dry macular degeneration is where the cells are just dying. There's a lack of nutrition, oxygen, and the cells are no longer there. So it's like having a moth-eaten hole in the middle of your vision. And so they are the two forms of late AMD. So if we're all on the same page, early, intermediate, and late, and late there's two sorts, wet and dry. And so most of the treatment and most of the research around the world is trying to do our best for those late vision-threatening stages of AMD. So let's turn our attention to wet AMD, that's the bleeding form of late stage AMD. And currently we have many good treatments. They require frequent injections into the eye with the aim of stopping those blood vessels from bleeding and thus destroying the retina. They do not in any way address the underlying cause of AMD, they're just trying to address the problem that's presented to us with this bleeding in the eye. And really, uh, in the last 15 years, this has really revolutionised our ability to save people from becoming legally blind. It has more than halved the rate of legal blindness around the world due to this disease. So fabulous. It has really been a, a, a game changer in this disease. So why do we need an, another treatment, I hear you ask. Um, so worldwide, people tend to be undertreated, even though the, the drugs are available, for many reasons, uh, people are not getting enough, in part due to the, the need for ongoing frequent injections, and that cannot be maintained for in everybody everywhere. But even in people who are well treated, so in Australia, for example, where the drug is minimally doesn't cost uh, us to get the drug, it does cost something to have it injected in many cases, but we do very well in terms of access to the drug. Even when we do modelling, which we did in Australia, we find that in the lifetime that someone has left, only 12% of people with wet AMT retain vision good enough for driving and 15% good enough to be able to read in one eye. So whilst much better than the natural history, that's still not um, you know, where we want to end up treating this disease. Part of this problem is that not all the... the issue is with the blood vessels being there, it's to do with the scarring and the fact that the cells still die. So even if you had the most fabulous drug that could stop the blood vessels leaking, we still have that underlying disease to contend with, the scarring and cell death. And so clearly there's room for improvement. Could we get a longer acting drug that at least would mean that you wouldn't need to come in so often that burden of ongoing regular treatments would be less? And then can we stop that down the track scarring and cell death that uh, tends to be the main cause of uh, vision loss down the track. So here is an example of one of my patients. I just wanted to illustrate that problem. And so for those that can uh, appreciate the slide, there's a, uh, the top slide shows some blood uh, right in the middle of the, the retina. That's the bit that you need for driving, recognising faces and reading. Uh, the scan, which is called an OCT scan, shows uh, some swelling in that um, that retina due to fluid. And the uh, drug, which are called anti-VEGF drugs, resolve beautifully the fluid and the leak. But you can hopefully see down the bottom, I'm left with this small scar. Albeit it is small, but it's right in the middle. And so this patient would have responded very well to the treatments we have, but unfortunately still would be left with quite poor central vision. And then 
Even though the lady was 95, she's now 101, doing well. But over, over the years, uh, again, the anti-VEGF, the blood-stopping uh, leaking drug, worked well. But her vision is now 660 or can only see the top letter of the chart due to this ongoing death of cells and fibrosis. So is there anything on the near horizon that might address this problem is also something to consider. And so I'd just like to introduce you to what will be the first new drug that we will get uh, to use in Australia for over 10 years. It's called Ferizumab, or you'll know it as Verbizmo when it becomes available. And it is not just an anti-blood vessel drug. Hopefully it will do more to address those two other problems, the, the atrophy and fibrosis. So in one injection now, we have two different actions. One will be the anti-blood vessel or the anti-VEGF action, and the other one will be hopefully to reduce inflammation and stabilise those blood vessels more. So potentially there will be a longer duration of action and hopefully that uh, more um, addressing that secondary problem of atrophy and scar. And so those trials in this drug have now completed, and here are just some, some results. So after two years of injections, about 80% of people with this new drug, Verbizmo, were able to be treated on 12 weekly or longer. So that's a, a, an injection every three months, um, whereas originally uh, we were treating everybody with the, when we first started treatments with monthly injections. And over half, so 63% of people could get out to only having an injection every 16 weeks or every four months bring us down to perhaps three injections a year, much more tolerable than the 12 we used to do. So we may be able to get more of our patients lasting longer between uh, their injection intervals. This particular result or these trials don't really tell us about the atrophy and fibrosis, but there is an ongoing um, uh, interest in, in understanding whether this drug will be helpful in that extent. Now, Ferizumab is already approved in America. They've been using it since the beginning of the year. Uh, and Australia got its approval uh, in August this year uh, to, uh, for use in Australia, but we're just awaiting it being listed on the PBS uh, to cover the cost of that in, in uh, treatment. And when it is available, it will, as I said, be the first new advance uh, in treating wet AMD in the past 10 years, other than a drug that really um, caused us too many side effects that we don't tend to use now. So this will be the, hopefully the next big step forward. But we do want to learn more about how it's used in the real world. And this is part of a study I've been involved in planning and will be the, the global PI for this study, which aims to look at the real world outcomes uh, once we start using this new drug. And this is really where we gain insights into how, how it's being used in the world. So we're going to have over 5,000 patients, hopefully 31 countries involved, many sites and also involve a range of clinicians, not just those that are in academic centres, not those that are just in um, big uh, centres like uh, capital cities. So around the world, we'll get some idea of what's going well and what isn't to try and make sure that the best outcomes for all patients are with this new treatment. So the take-home message then for wet AMD is that Ferizumab is this new treatment. Uh, it's more than hopefully just uh, stopping the blood vessels from leaking. We will await the real-world evidence to see whether we can extend more people at the longer intervals than we currently do. And hopefully it may have some impact on those unmet needs, which is the ongoing cell death and uh, scar formation. Now let's turn our attention to the dry AMD. If you remember, this is the one where the cells just die slowly. Much The, the loss of vision is much slower uh, than in wet AMD. And so dry AMD or geographic atrophy is like having a moth-eaten hole in the middle of your vision. And currently we have no treatments for this. There are no approved treatments that will either stop this from happening or prevent it growing once it happens. However, we're very, very close to having our first treatment. And so we're on really on the cusp or the dawn of a new treatment uh, for this dry form of AMD. And I just wanted to show this picture is for those that can appreciate it. Uh, when you look in uh, a person's eye or take a normal colored photo, it's always hard to really tell the extent of, of where the cells are dying. But this black and white photo is called an autofluorescent picture. And it really tells you exactly in black and white where the cells are alive and where they're dead. So black means missing cells or these moth-eaten holes. And so this is a picture that actually is not so comfortable to have in the rooms, but if you're a patient and having these very bright images, this allows us to actually see the extent of the cell death. And that's currently the image that we use now to monitor the progression of the dry form of AMD. 
And you can see here, again, a couple of my patients, the top one shows this sort of relentless uh, growth of the holes, still sparing the middle. So the vision is still good, but you can see it's coming closer and closer. And this is very much the sort of person that you might like to treat if there was a drug. The bottom one shows a different uh, scenario where already, unfortunately, the atrophy is in the, the middle, vision is already poor, and maybe there's not so much to be gained by uh, injecting this eye with the uh, drug because already the central vision is poor and the growth is really quite slow. But the, the uh, main message is that these sort of images, this fabulous way to, to image now the retina that differentiates healthy cells from dead cells will be the way that we'll monitor this disease. And so just very quickly then, we don't know what causes AMD. There's a whole lot of different pathways involved in the health of the cells in the back of the eye. And thus there are many trials trying to address this problem of, of how you keep the cells alive. And this is really just a picture to show there's been a lot of work for many years and many un unfortunate um, drugs that really have made no difference. And so there's a lot of uh, attrition along the way. But most of the trials have been in trying to address inflammation, this ongoing low-grade chronic inflammation in the retina, which is thought to be responsible for cells dying. And so this is the main result from this, the drug which is most likely to arrive on our shores first. Uh, these, these trials are called uh, Oaks and Derby. They are two big, large, multi-centre studies around the world. And after two years of having injections every month in your eye, hopefully those that can appreciate the graph show that uh, the growth rate in the blue and the orange line is slower than the grey line, which is the natural history. So it does not slow, doesn't stop the cells from dying, it slows it down. It's a step forward. It's not hopefully the end game in treating this disease, but certainly is a first step towards trying to save vision for a little longer in these patients. And the next trial in the next drug targeting a similar pathway shows very similar. So it doesn't look like we, we know yet how to stop cells from dying, but we can seem like we can slow them down. And so there are many other ways trying to, rather than get away with having monthly injections, maybe you can do injections under the skin, maybe you can take tablets for this, but possibly the more um, realistic and interesting one is gene therapy. And this is where a one-off treatment surgery to the back of the eye that would deliver a gene that would do what we're trying to do with those injections or the ongoing treatment. So this is probably the way to go in dry AMD, is a one-off treatment, put in a gene that dampens down the inflammation so you don't have to have those ongoing um, treatments. And so the key message then for dry AMD is we expect the first treatment to be approved in the US this year. It's not definite, but we expect that. And then after that, Europe will follow and then we'll see what happens in Australia. It's actually not a, a foregone conclusion that we will approve this drug because after two years of treatment, there fails to be any obvious benefit to the patient in terms of what they see, remembering that that central vision is often good till the end. So we still have some work to do to convince authorities that it's a good idea to stop these cells from dying in the back of your eye. Um, and so many other trials will follow in close succession after this first one. And so we've still got a lot more to learn about dry AMD. And then finally, what we would rather do is stop you getting there in the first place. So how, how can we intervene in people known to be at risk how do we stop them progressing to either the dry and the wet? And this is really where, where we really want to focus our attention. And for the last 25 years or so, I've been interested in, in slowing down the progression with the use of lasers. And there's an Australian-made laser, which is called a nanosecond laser. It's a very fast pulse laser, which does not burn the retina at all. It's very safe. And our early large studies show quite promising results. And we're in the middle now of planning a large multi-centre international trial to validate the early results that we did in Australia. And so we need everybody's help uh, to get these patients for the dry and the early AMD because they don't usually present to casualties at tertiary referral hospitals. It's hard for us to find these patients because they're in the community. So we're making a big effort to try and engage with optometry and our community ophthalmologists to, to find these patients so that they can be part of this world-class research. So I think uh, just I'll end on the CIRA is aiming, we have a website that you can find out about our trials. You can either refer a patient if you're a clinician or you can actually register your own interest if you're a patient. 
very easily now on our website. So encourage anybody who has a family member or themselves that has this disease or many others, they can look at our website. So it's 25 years since I started the Macular Research Unit and we had a celebration earlier this year and I thank all my team for all their wonderful hard work to get us this far. And I'll end there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robin. That was fantastic. It's just so um, exciting to see that the long drought for dry AMD may soon be um, breaking. So that's uh, very exciting. Probably not the most appropriate analogy given our weather at the moment, but nevertheless. Uh, now it's my pleasure to speak to you um, about a subject that's uh, close to my heart, and that is um, diabetes. Um, if we can just go back one. Oh, there we go. So this is um, a story of, of two parts today. So I'm going to talk initially about um, the KeepSight program that Keith alluded to earlier, which is a, an initiative to make sure people are getting their eyes checked regularly. Um, and the second part on some exciting new research that our team is doing. So um, with no further ado, um, everyone in the room will know someone, a friend, a family member, or perhaps they themselves will have diabetes. It's a very common disease and I thought it would be uh, useful because it's hard to conceptualise you know big numbers but a way of thinking about it might be to think about if diabetes was a country what would its population be what would it be similar to and I might just get you to think to yourselves which one of these options is most likely do you think the total number of people with diabetes in the world is similar to the combined population of Australia and New Zealand option A Option B, the populations of Brazil and France. So the first option, 30 million. Brazil and France having a combined population of 280 million. Or the third option is C, the combined populations of America, Russia and Italy at half a billion people. Which would you think? Would anyone hazard a guess? C, you're right. So half a billion people. It's quite extraordinary when you think of it that way the entire population of America, Russia and Italy, and the numbers are growing. So clearly that poses some massive challenges um, at the health system level. How do we meet the needs of all of these people? Um, if we look uh, from an Australian perspective, there are 1.7 million Australians, we believe, living with diabetes. About 500,000 of those have not yet received a diagnosis. They have diabetes ticking over in the background. And we also know from surveys, including ones that we've done here at CIRA, that about half of people with diabetes don't access regular eye screening. And you might ask why that's important. Well, one of the most common complications of long-term diabetes is damage to the retina. It's called diabetic retinopathy. So we know if we did a straw poll of, of people in Australia with diabetes, we just take people off the street, we would find signs of diabetic retinopathy in one in three people. So it's there, and it's a significant cause of vision loss in blindness. In fact, it's one of the leading causes of avoidable vision loss and blindness. And that's the key word here, avoidable. Almost all vision loss and blindness from diabetes is preventable if the disease is detected early and the right treatments initiated. Unfortunately, in Australia, we have brilliant eye health care services, great access, we have good reimbursement, so people don't need to be out of pocket to go and see an optometrist. Uh, but screening for diabetic eye disease is ad hoc. It's hit and miss. It's very much dependent on whether your GP reminds you regularly, uh, whether you go and see um, your eye care provider at the right intervals. And that means people are falling between the cracks and, and suffering uh, needless vision loss. So um, yeah, about six years ago now, I, I met up with the um, CEO of Diabetes Australia, a man called Greg Johnson, and, and together we embarked on a, on a mission to try and change this ad hoc nature of screening uh, for diabetic eye disease in Australia. Uh, and we had tremendous support from Diabetes Australia, but also from Optometry Australia, the um, Royal Australian New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists and many other stakeholders. Um, and we uh, came together to design uh, a screening initiative that would work for Australia given the peculiarities of our health system with the simple aim of ensuring that all people with diabetes get timely screening. So um, essentially KeepSight is a digital reminder system. So it starts with a, a registration process 
and um, that registration process can be people going to the Keepsite website and signing themselves up. We had high hopes for this um, route of recruitment, um, but we found that you know a few years in, uh, that, that only about 1% to 2% of all of our registrations are self-registrations. The thing that we've learned is that people want their healthcare provider, their optometrist or their ophthalmologist to recommend that they're signed up and help them with the process. So that's really sh um, shifted our efforts to making sure that we have Keepsight integrated into the electronic health record of every optometry practice in Australia. So that's our immediate goal. Um, Specsavers um, bolted out of the gate and was a, the, a rapid adopter. And, and so most of our early registrations have been through the Specsavers chain. But we now have um, Luxottica, OPSM, um, and, and a whole host of other chains coming on soon. Um, and we will soon have the major electronic health record providers for every optometrist in Australia on board with Keepsight. So it's just a click of a button and the patient can be registered to the program. Once people are registered with Keepsight, they get reminders which are additional to the routine reminders they might get from their optometrist. But we found that people tend to respond more to Keepsight reminders than they do to reminders from their optometrist. Here are some quotes. Diabetes Australia is a trusted voice. And that's one of the things that we were very careful about initially, is making sure that Diabetes Australia was running the program because Diabetes Australia is an organisation by people with diabetes for people with diabetes. It's a lead uh, organisation in the nation for people with diabetes. Um, and that's really important, that, that trust that Diabetes Australia has built up for so many years. Uh, there was a perception that there's no vested interest. Oh, you know, I'm just getting asked to come back for, a, for an eye check because they want to sell me some glasses, which is often a barrier. Um, and, and we've also found from our focus group testing that people like reminders, the, actually the more reminders the better. So how are we going? So these were figures uh, at June of this year um, with almost a quarter of a million registrants, so 244,000 in June. We're now um, edging closer to 300,000. Uh, and as I said initially, um, many um, of those early registrations uh, were people who were attending Specsavers practices, but the balance is now being redressed. But we've now achieved 82% of all people with diabetes. Uh, who attend a Specsavers practice are signed up with Keepsight. So that's tremendous. Oh, there we go. Um, we've had almost, um, we've had 370,000 Keepsight visits to optometrists around the nation, um, which is tremendous. And I would say that there's pretty good geographic spread. So every state, every territory has um, good representation. Most of those people have been just once so far, but we are now starting to see people coming back. We've issued 135,000 reminders, mostly via digital means, emails and SMS. Um, and our optometrists are saying we've noticed a marked increase in timely reattendances and in response to our reminder letters. So we're making good headway, um, but there's still a way to go. There are you know, 1.2 million people with diagnosed diabetes, so we need to go from 300,000 to 1.2 million, and, and that's our aspiration. And we know that um, some of the people who've signed up to keep sight early on were those who are already uh, quite engaged in their eye care. So our, our major focus is getting people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities engaged, and particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who we know are at far higher risk of diabetes and far higher risk of, of devastating complications. So changing tack now, that's the sort of community health um, initiative, and, and CIRA has been a driving force in that program. I thought I'd shift to some of the work that, that my uh, very talented research team is doing. Um, and so this, this is looking at a new type of imaging, and, and Keith alluded to that. We've been looking at Alzheimer's disease, but we're also very keen to develop better eye tests um, for diabetes. So uh, the, the title of this um, part of the talk is Improving the Identification at People at Risk of Sight-Threatening Diabetic Retinopathy or Diabetic Eye Disease. So why should we do so? Well, the major driver of diabetic retinopathy is the blockage of tiny blood vessels at the back of the eye. The fancy word for that is ischemia, just means a lack of blood supply. 
That's the main driver of the disease. And it's also really important to identify that to work out the risk of someone progressing to the site-threatening complications of the disease. We've got good tools already to detect this. Uh, the mainstay is a test called an angiogram. You might have had an angiogram in the past. You get a needle into a vein in your arm. You get a contrast agent, a dye, injected into the veins that travels through the heart and up into your eyes. And as it's passing through that very intricate circulation of the back of the eye and the retina, um, images are taken with a bright blue flash and we capture the fluorescence of that particular dye as it's passing through that little um, network of um, blood vessels. It's a very good test, but it's uh, invasive, it's time consuming, it's costly, and it carries a rare risk of, of allergy. So it's not without its downsides. There's another technique. Um, many of you will have had an OCT when you see your optometrist or an ophthalmologist. You'll see a black and white sort of image, uh, almost looking like a slice of lasagna, which is the back of your eye, which has been um, imaged in cross-section. There's a particular flavour of OCT called OCT angiography, which gives us very detailed view of the blood vessels. But unfortunately, most of the machines that um, optometrists and ophthalmologists can afford um, actually quite cumbersome and quite low resolution. So there's room to do better. Um, so we, our team's been working with hyperspectral imaging. It's a new type of retinal photography. But instead of having a single white light flash, what we do is we acquire many different images of the back of the eye with different colours of light. And that gives us very detailed information about the back of the eye, far richer information than we would get with a standard photo. And we can then use artificial intelligence to find um, new features of diseases, so things that we can't see with the conventional approaches. Um, and the underlying um, principle is that uh, when we um, use different wavelengths of light, the camera senses uh, recording the amount of light bouncing back from the eye. And there's a physical interaction of the light with the tissue that's influenced by the structure of the tissue, in this case, the retina. So, um, and that's also dependent on the colour of light. So if we get information with different colours of light, we're getting much richer, richer information about that structure. So the question that, that our group has um, set out to answer is whether this imaging approach uh, can detect uh, signs of this lack of blood supply to the back of the eye um, based on the reflectance signal of blood in the retina. And you might ask why. Well, even when we're young kids, we know this, uh, this to be true, that arterial blood, the blood in our arteries, which is carrying lots of oxygen, is bright red, whereas the blood from our veins looks darker colour, sort of a darker bluer um, colour. And if you look at the graph there, that's if we take some arterial blood, the red curve, um, or some venous blood in the blue curve, and we look at its absorption of light, you can see that the arterial blood, which has got lots of oxygen in it, is, is um, not absorbing much red light. It's reflecting the red light, so it looks red. Um, and so that's why uh, arterial blood's red and venous blood is, blue, is bluer. So that, of course, is the underlying principle by which the pulse oximeter works to measure the oxygen saturation in your blood, the thing that gets popped on your fingertip when you go to emergency or your doctor that reads the amount of saturation of oxygen in your blood. Basically, it's shining two different colours of light through your fingertip. There's a little detector at the other side, and it's working out the ratios of absorption of, of um, those two different colours of light to estimate the amount of oxygen in your blood. So we wondered whether we could do something similar in the eye using our hyperspectral camera. So we recruited patients from the eye and ear, uh, and those patients were needing to undergo an angiogram test. Uh, and we had cases in one group, those are people who had blockage of blood vessels in the back of the eye, and controls in another um, group who'd had an angiogram, but it was all normal. Uh, we had, uh, in this small study, 55 people, a good balance between genders, uh, similar ages between the groups, and you'll see that um, almost 80% um, of our participants had diabetic retinopathy. So we acquired images on, um, on this device. You'll note this quite large um, camera system. It's got quite a small field of view. So the, the view that we get in those images of the retina are actually quite small. So we have to take quite a number of those images and paste them together. So you can see that sort of tiling of those image stacks together. We then overlay that on the angiogram test. Remember, these people have had an angiogram as well. 
And then what we do, we get our retinal specialist to mark out in red any parts of that, um, that angiogram image that are lacking blood supply. So we can then use that, those red labelled areas to train an artificial intelligence system to see whether we can pick that up using the multicoloured flash imaging alone, so without the need for an angiogram. And to cut a long story short, we've done that and we've shown that it's highly successful. We can predict with a great degree of, degree of accuracy for every location in the retina whether there's um, oxygenated blood there or not. And so that's a very promising um, tool because this technology could be used as part of routine screening for diabetic retinopathy. The same photo that you would have to detect whether you've got retinopathy or not could tell you if there's areas of the retina that are lacking blood supply and that could then inform whether you need to come back um, sooner or whether you need treatment earlier. Um, so really personalising care and that can help us to manage this huge burden of disease um, with half a billion people because at the moment our tools are not very accurate at detecting who's going to pro progress and who's not. So we have to see people more often. We have to see them every year. So maybe if your scan is normal, we could say we'll see you in five years. Um, here's just some examples. The um, angiogram images at the top. The red spots are the ones that are lacking blood supply. And anything in white is, um, is what our artificial intelligence system has predicted as lacking blood. And you can see very close correspondence between the white and the red. Um, so finally, we are um, now on um, a validation study for this technology, a larger study with more patients, and, and part of this is supported by um, Diabetes Australia, so we're very grateful for that. Um, the, the major innovation here is that we, our team has developed our own retinal camera that can do this. Um, this doesn't need eye drops to dilate the pupil, unlike the other one. Uh, it's much faster. It's a quarter of a second to capture these images. It's got a wider field of view and it's much more detailed. So we're very excited about that and we hope that anywhere where you see a retinal camera today, tomorrow you'll see one of these cameras to improve um, health for people with diabetes. So I'd like to thank my team and uh, look forward to questions. And it's now my great privilege to welcome my friend and colleague, Lindell Lim, uh, to give the next talk. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to drop the microphone. A bit shorter than Peter here. Uh, I, de I dare say I'm probably the shortest in the room. Um, but it gives me great pleasure to actually talk to you about clinical trials and why we actually do clinical trials. And uh, I'm a clinician. Uh, my main area is in uveitis, so that's inflammation inside the eye. So what I'm going to do for you today is really talk you through how clinical trials has actually revolutionised the treatment of um, uveitis um, really talking about one of my patients who I've known for many, many years. So this um, is a 35-year-old mechanic who I first met 12 years ago. At that stage, he had had something called Bechet's uveitis. So Bechet's disease is an autoimmune condition that affects many parts of the body, but partic particularly the eyes. And it can be a really severe form of disease that can cause blindness. Now, when I met this mechanic 12 years ago, he was already blind in one eye as a result of his disease um, from his Bechet's uveitis and he came to see me at the time at the eye near hospital with a severe flare-up in his remaining eye. Now you can imagine he was petrified because he already knew what had happened in that eye in his first eye that went blind and he's sitting there I've got two young kids you know how am I going to support my family if I lose vision in this eye because all of the treatments we've used so far haven't worked so this is where we were at that point in time now essentially for those of you who are not familiar familiar with uveitis uveitis is inflammation inside the eye we've all heard about arthritis the itis means inflammation so arthritis inflammation in a joint uveitis inflammation inside the eye now most of uveitis in Australia is autoimmune, where your immune system fights part of your body in a case of mistaken identity, and that's what's actually happening with my mechanic. Now, even though it's rare, we know um, in a study that we did a few years ago at the INE Hospital and the Centre for Eye Research Australia that uveitis only affects 35 per 100,000 people in Melbourne, so it's quite rare. 
Having said that, though, it punches above its weight with regards to legal irreversible blindness. It accounts for about 15%, 30% in a place like the INU Hospital, which is obviously a tertiary referral centre. And because of the fact that it actually causes blindness so, um, so commonly, it's the fifth most common cause of irreversible blindness in the United States and also in Australia. Now, uveitis also affects younger people, just like my mechanic, people who are trying to basically work and support their family and therefore rep represents a greater productive loss to society in proportion. So how do we treat uveitis? We treat it with drops, shots and pills. And as you can see by this slide, there is a whole lot of different treatments that we can possibly choose from. So how do we know which one to use? And you probably sit there going, well, obviously you choose the best one. However, what we think is best is actually subject to bias, okay? A lot of these sort of things is like, I think it's going to work. I think I have got a clear, a very clear understanding of what is good and what is bad, but we are subject to bias. And one, one of these biases can be nicely illustrated by this slide here, where you get something new and you think, well, this is going to be fantastic. But then you realise, actually, that perhaps your, your hopes and your expectations are probably unrealistic or subject to populism, OK? So that is why we need clinical trials. We need clinical trials to give us unbiased evidence that we need to decide whether or not a new treatment actually works and getting back to the original question of trying to work out which is the best treatment for my patient. So how do we do that? So there is this concept of double masking and randomization. So masking is so when you as, or someone as a, a patient as a subject in the trial has no idea which treatment they're getting. And as the treating doctor, I have no idea which treatment you're getting. And the treatment that you're given is random. Okay, there's no order to it, so no one really knows. Okay, we also need to make sure in our trials that we are comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges. Even something like, as Robin mentioned, age-related macular degeneration, we know that there are clear differences between wet age-related macular degeneration and dry, even though they both can cause blindness. So we need to make sure we're treating the right form of disease at the right stage. And that's what clinical trials does. We strictly define who should be in the trial so we know that we're all comparing the same thing. Now, I'm now going to actually illustrate a few of these clinical trials that we've done at the Centre for Eye Research Australia. And these are all multinational trials. And all of the trials that I'm going to describe to you involve the Centre for Eye Research Australia and the INU Hospital as the only Australian site selected to take part in these trials. And this is really based upon the quality of the research, the clinical research that we do. So as I said to you before, we treat uveitis with drops, shots or pills. And I'm going to start with shots. Okay, so we're talking about injections into the eye. And the question is, okay, so which of these injections are best? There are lots of different injections we can actually inject into the eye. There are lots of different types of steroid that we can inject into the eye. And there's other um, treatments as well, such as anti-VEGF treatments that we use for wet age-related macular degeneration. And if you just ask different clinicians, they say, well, in my hands, I think this treatment works better. But we don't know until we do a trial. And there was these two trials that were funded by the United States government, so the National Institutes of Health, for which they actually um, asked people around the world to take part in and we actually did this ran these trials here in Australia at the Centre for Eye Research and essentially we found that out of all the different drugs out there only steroids actually really work and of the, all the different types of steroids we found that two of them in particular worked better than the others. So these are from these randomised trials where previously everyone sort of said well I think this one works and this one works but we now know We've got evidence base that only a few of these injections actually work. How about tablets? Now, the mainstay of tablet treatment or systemic treatment, so we take a tablet and it affects the whole body, is something called prednisolone. And I'm sure many of you are actually familiar with this. We use it for 
asthma, we use it for autoimmune disease, we use it for a whole lot of different things. And they're very, very effective, but only in the short term. Well, they're effective in the long term too. But the longer you take these medications, the more likely you are to get into trouble from side effects. And that right-hand side of the slide is just a, short, a small section of side effects that you can get from this medication. And 99.9% .9 of people who take these drugs for long enough will get side effects. And in fact, I would say the 0.1% who don't uh, get the side effects are probably not taking the drug. Okay. So what are the other UV artist treatments? There's a whole lot of them here. And again, we're back to the same situation of, well, which one of these is best? The FAST trial, again, also funded by the US government, okay, was looking at two of these medications that have been around for a little while. Methotrexate, which has been around for decades and decades, and mycophenolate, which has only been around for the past 20 years. Before this trial came out, everyone thought that mycophenolate would be better, being the newer, brighter, you know, more uh, interesting medication, as opposed to methotrexate, which we've had for almost 100 years. And what we actually found from this randomised trial was that the oldie was the goodie. Okay, so the methotrexate was actually better despite initial impressions. The other question that comes up is that if you have uveitis for many years, are you better off having injections, because we know they work from the previous trial, are we better off with these injections every so often, or you're better off on a tablet that you take every day? And this is a MUST study, so another randomised study, which actually showed that initially the injection tr group did better, but in the long term, when we followed them beyond two years, it actually was the, the patients who were on tablets who actually did better. Literally the um, classic example of the tortoise versus the hare. Okay. So this again changed, our, um, changed the way we treat our patients. Clinical trials, as, um, as Robin has actually already explained to you, uh, with age-related macular degeneration is also the way that we actually determine whether or not a, treat, a new treatment actually works. And this is the same in uveitis, where you, some of you might have heard of these new treatments called biologics. These are new treatments that actually target certain molecules in your body, just targeted molecules, rather than a, you know, a shotgun approach that affects many different pathways, and therefore perhaps high rates of side effects. And one of these molecules is TNF, which is thought to cause a lot of inflammation. And so as a result, there's a new medication called adalimumab, or Humira, which is an anti-TNF. It targets and reduces the effect of this TNF um, medication. Now, again, in a randomised controlled trial, we actually found that um, this anti-TNF molecule, adalimumab, works very well in uveitis, as shown in this graph. So how does that impact my mechanic? So essentially when I first met him, this Humira, this new medication, had just, been come, um, had just been proven to perhaps work. So we popped him into this trial and we found that he did incredibly well. His left eye settled down after two injections of the steroids, which I found we know from the trials worked, and his uveitis has remained controlled ever since. He has not had a flare up whilst he's continued on the Humira and the methotrexate, that oldie and goodie medication that I mentioned to you before. His uveitis has remained quiet. He's stopped his prednisolone, that toxic medication. He's lost 12 kilos as a result of that, and he was no longer clinically um, depressed. He's still working. His kids are now towards the end of high school. Okay, and he's done brilliantly well. I only now only see him twice a year, as opposed to almost every week when I first met him. So we still have clinical trials running in, um, at the Centre for Eye Research and the INE Hospital. Our aim is to better use or better use the drugs that we have. Our aim is to try and find new treatments to make those sort of life-changing ch um, uh, changes to our patients. We have lots of different clinical trials um, at the Centre for Eye Research. This is just a summary of the past trials over the past five, five years. And this is over the past 12 months, you can see we now cover many other areas in ophthalmology. And those in the STARS are the new tre uh, uh, treatment trials that we are now looking at starting up early next year. Um, on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for your um, attention and I think we're now open to questions. Is that right, Peter?
Thank you, Lindell. That was excellent. Um, before we get to questions, because I know you're bursting to ask questions, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, um, Senior Philanthropy Manager Ryan McCarthy. Ryan has come to Sierra with um, 15 years of experience in fundraising and philanthropy, and um, he just exudes passion uh, for creating meaningful, memorable opportunities for donors to connect, collaborate, and create visionary change. So he joined Sierra earlier this year, and many of you may have already had the pleasure of speaking with him. He's here today, um, and so please feel free to speak to him at lunch. But today, uh, I'd welcome Ryan to talk to us about Sierra's new bequest and monthly giving programs. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all. Thanks for coming uh, and braving the wild weather out there and joining us today. We deeply appreciate uh, the opportunity to meet with you all in person after such a long time. Um, you might have noticed the very colourful, beautiful and light-filled artwork behind me. Um, this is by one of our, our wonderful supporters, uh, Madeline Popper, who's a Melbourne-based artist uh, who, who is living with age-related macular degeneration. And she's really... Um, uh, a champion for Syra uh, and has kindly um, donated her artworks for us to reproduce in, in some of our fundraising materials. And you'll see some of those out the front. Um, and if you're interested uh, in, in talking to Madeline about her work, uh, her, de her details are, are on our cards out the front. But when Madeline was first diagnosed with macular degeneration 20 years ago, she was told that she would not be able to drive or read or even see faces within two years. Uh, this revelation uh, that she would lose her sight made Madeline even more determined to pursue her passion for the arts and, and take up, it was around this time that she, she took up a practice Northern of oil painting. Today, her sight has declined to the point where she can no longer uh, see the end of her brush. So she paints with her fingers instead. And Madeline says that she hopes that her sharing her work encourages more interest in the creative achievements of people with low vision and blindness, but also that it gets people thinking about the importance of research for an ageing population. So please um, don't hesitate to let me know if you'd, if you'd like to contact, uh, get into contact with Madeline and, and learn more about her work. I'd also like to take a moment to talk to you today about some of the ways that you can support our work and be a light for people living with eye disease. Finding new treatments to improve the lives of patients with eye disease is at the heart of, of all of our research and work at CIRA, and it's your compassion, your commitment, and the generous support that, that you provide that makes the critical work that you've been hearing about today possible. Uh, we've recently launched uh, a couple of new initiatives at CIRA, uh, a, a monthly giving program uh, called Luminaries, which is a great way, a very easy way to support our, our site-saving work, our discovery research, our clinical trials, uh, while ensuring that your donations have um, a, a, a really great impact. Uh, ongoing support ensures that our scientists and clinicians can continue to perform their, their very ambitious and life-changing work but it also helps us uh, with long-term planning um, so that we can, we can uh, have long-term projects uh, and continue to inquire into eye conditions. Another great way to support our work is to consider leaving a gift to Sarah in your will. Uh, a gift to Sarah is a, truly a gift of hope for future generations with eye disease. Every trial and every set of results and every breakthrough that we see at CIRA is bringing us closer to a new era in eye research um, and a, a new era of vision and, and ultimately our uh, vision of a world free from vision loss and blindness. So by le considering leaving a gift in your will, you'll be enabling um, these breakthroughs uh, and uh, our research long into the future and leaving a legacy of sight for future generations. I'd just like to share with you uh, a video, which is of another one of our, our stars of CIRA, um, and that's Jenny Turnbull, who I had the pleasure of meeting with recently. 
Um, she, she really wanted to share her story. Uh, she's living with glaucoma and, um, and she has, has very kindly uh, shared her story um, to, as an ambassador for CIRA to promote the, the work that we're doing and to promote our, our Gifts in Wills program. So I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you. I was born in East Malvern and grew up in Oakley. It was a happy childhood and we had many happy holidays, day trips, picnics and I'm very grateful for the life I've had. My mother was diagnosed with glaucoma. It was 1961. Didn't mean a much to me at that stage, but in 1994 I went to an optometrist in the city and soon after I was diagnosed with glaucoma. The glaucoma hasn't stopped me doing anything at this particular time. I enjoy theatre, I love being down at the beach and just being able to appreciate these things through sight. I began donating to the Centre for Eye Research in 1994 because I felt that I had benefited from having a very good specialist and because it's hereditary, I thought family could well get it in the future and it would be one area that I could give something towards research. I share a home now with a friend and we've been together for 44 years. Janet and I both play tennis. We enjoy working together in the garden. I guess we live far busier lives because if anything comes up, there's two of you to do it. We have updated our wills. If there's any money over when I die, that I would leave a, a small request to the Centre for our Research. I think it's an excellent organisation. It is world renowned and they have some excellent researchers and they're doing some great work. Work will continue on and if I can make some small contribution, I'm helping future generations. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was um, excellent. Um, I might uh, welcome Keith onto the stage as well. It's now question time, so um, please feel free to um, ask any questions. We've got roving microphones, so um, if you want to ask a question, just pop your hand up, and um, please don't be shy. This is a, a rare opportunity for you ask, uh, to ask us anything. It doesn't have to be linked to uh, the presentations that you've seen today. So does anyone want to open up with a question? And I, and I must add that uh, in the spirit of the Triceratops uh, exhibition, that if questions are not forthcoming, we will be doing our best uh, dinosaur interpretations. <laughs> Which I don't think is going to be all that amusing. So please uh, feel free. While we wait, I might... Uh, oh, yeah, we've got a question there. Thank you. It's a question for Robin. Robin, I, I've heard... You know, we've all heard about AMD and I've been hearing about it for many years, but I think the thought just crystallised today from your speech that it's actually wet and dry are completely different diseases. Thanks for the question. Um, so, no. So, I think the way you should look at it is that the dry AMD is the natural progression. So, the retina is not healthy and the cells die. So, that happens to everyone. And then in about a third of people that progress to late AMD, they're able to mount a response to the retinal cells being lacking oxygen and nutrients. And so the unhealthy cells say, well, if nothing happens, I'm going to die, so why don't you try and make me some new blood vessels? So the eye responds in a way that you think would be a good idea. It makes new blood vessels, but unfortunately they're not made properly and they leak. However, the more we learn and the more we have wonderful imaging techniques like Peter um, alluded to, this ability to see the blood vessels actually in the bottom of the eye when you're looking with OCT angiography, lo and behold, we actually see some people actually do make those new blood vessels, which they've been asked to do, and they're not leaking. So they're there for good, not for bad. And then just at some point, the eye is unable to keep them recapitulating the layer that they've lost and then they, they go in and leak. So the idea now actually perhaps is not to completely aim to annihilate those new vessels, but to help them mature and stay there and, and try and control any leak that comes to stop them damaging the retina. So I think um, they're not totally different diseases. Thanks for the question. 
think just following on from that, it, it shows us, doesn't it, Robin, just how um, our understanding of the disease has evolved. Uh, and part of that's through um, clinical trials, parts through fundamental research, but also parts through lived experience, isn't it, Robin? And, and um, tracking the progress of our patients who are in, in care. Absolutely, but also the eye just lends itself to the imaging. So in terms of uh, bits of the anatomy that you can actually get access to, now with such wonderful advances in imaging, we know we can actually see almost histological uh, level of detail uh, in the retina, which has made a huge difference to, to what we know about these diseases. Uh, questions there and there and in the middle. Thank you. Hi. I'm, I'm just asking this question because I had cataracts done recently. How does the cataract operation affect the life of your, your eye? The life of your eye? Yes. Yeah. So, so we haven't touched on cataract surgery, although it is the most common cause of, of um, common operation done in Australia. And I'm probably not the best to answer this because I don't do that. But um, and I don't want to hold the microphone. But uh, let me... Yeah, so cataract surgery is a, a, a fantastic operation that has a life-changing effect on, on people who have lost vision due to cataracts. Um, it doesn't have uh, adverse effects on other aspects of how the eye functions, uh, and that's an important um, point. So, so um, we're, we're, we're cautious with cataract surgery sometimes in people with advanced glaucoma, um, because, because when we do cataract surgery, any operation puts a little bit of stress on the eye, and so we're, we're cautious about that. And in macular degeneration, uh, we always warn patients that, that the, the, the final improvement in the vision is variable and it, and, and it will depend sometimes more on the, on the underlying macular degeneration than the cataract itself. But, uh, but uh, you can treat cataract in the context of these other diseases and often that will still give you some benefit. And Lindell led a, uh, a world first study looking at one of the complications that occur um, following cataract surgery in people with diabetes. So, Lindell, do you want to tell us briefly about that study? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So, if you have diabetes um, affecting the eye, like what Peter has actually mentioned with the diabetic retinopathy, we know that the cataract surgery, because it can cause some inflammation inside the eye, it can actually make the um, di diabetic retinopathy in the eye get worse. Now, you know, there are treatments uh, for this uh, which are mainly injections, so they're these anti-VEGF treatments, but there's also these steroid treatments that I also alluded to in uveitis. And so the trial that we did was to actually uh, do a randomised trial comparing these two medications, and we found that the steroid was actually better at the time of surgery at dampening down the inflammation and stopping the retinopathy, the diabetic retinopathy from getting worse. So that's actually changed our understanding. It's just to really, we can actually modify that and actually stabilise the eye. It's a short-term change, and so basically the whole idea is to keep everything stable, and then after 6 to 12 months, it sort of goes back to the, your baseline. Thank you. We had a question in the middle there. Second question before you go, please. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is a bit, perhaps a bit naive, but can we solve the problem with an eye transplant? I mean, you, you have heart transplant and everything else. Why not an eye transplant? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And, and there is, believe it or not, a lot of work going on in this field. It's, a, it, it's almost like a moonshot because there, there are a whole range of different problems you have to solve to achieve effective eye transplantation. And, in, and one of the and major problems that we have is actually repairing the optic nerve, the nerve that connects the eye to the brain. Um, and that's something that my lab... Um, works on and we're, we're, we're developing ways to do that but it's more complicated than that because you also have to restore the blood supply and uh, and and that's an important part of this as well and that is a very technically challenging thing to achieve it is being done though and, there, and there's some very impressive work going on looking at a whole eye transplantation in, in animal models um, it's, it's a long way from being something which we're using um, clinically but but it's um, in the past, many scientists would have said it's, it's crazy. There's no way that that's ever going to be possible. And now there are sort of conceivable routes to um, achieving some sort of restoration of vision with, with eye transplantation. Now, the quality of that vision you know, would remain to be seen, and there are a lot of technical challenges. I don't want to get people's hope up that this is you know, just around the corner, but, but there is... 
for sure. But yeah. um, just to note, like a corneal transplant has been going for hundreds of, well, many decades and is very successful. So in fact, little bits of the eye you can transplant and indeed in AMD they're looking at transplanting the layer of cells which is thought to be very crucial in keeping the photoreceptors alive. So it may be a long way till we transplant the whole lot but bit by bit uh, we, we might get there. And talking about transplantation, what about bionic vision? <laughs> So um, the Centre for Iris Australia and myself have been involved for over 10 years now uh, on trying to um, get, give back vision. So up until now we've been talking about trying to keep vision good and not lose it, but what do you do when you've lost it? How do you get it back? And for a long time we've been working on trying to um, artificially stimulate vision by uh, de designing a bionic eye. But perhaps even more exciting is now the ability to actually ask cells that are surviving to do the job of the photoreceptors. <clears throat> so we have a very clever basic scientist working at CIRA that are trying to make cells that are in the eye, so in the retina, for example, structural cells that don't normally respond to light. How can you, you give them the, the information to make them now into cells that would respond to light? And that truly is uh, revolutionary and will be fantastic when that's seen its end. Fantastic. I hope no one's got dinner plans tonight because we can go all day. <laughs> um, next question. Thank you. And then up the back. Yeah, uh, you've got enough to talk about. I realise that. But you haven't mentioned much about glaucoma and what gains there have been with uh, repair, uh, stopping, etc., etc. And with that, a follow-up question you almost touched on there is had there been any um, gains in trying or testing the use of stem cells in repairing the optic nerve? Uh, great, great questions and uh, a topic close to my heart. Um, and we will be holding other f uh, f forums that, that will focus on glaucoma in, in coming um, sessions as well. So, so there will be an opportunity to, to talk more about that. But, but there's a lot of work going on um, and again, we, we've talked about this change from just trying to slow down conditions to actually trying to restore vision. And that's, and that's something which is um, a focus in glaucoma as well. And one of the ways that we're doing that is to build on some work that my predecessor started at, uh, at CIRA, uh, that was Jonathan Croston, um, working on vitamin B3 and, and he organized a, a very nice clinical trial that showed that you could improve some aspects of visual function in some patients with glaucoma in the short term by oral supplementation with vitamin B3. And, um, and, and so what we have worked together with, with Jonathan and others to plan is a big international collaboration to ask the question, can vitamin B3 in the longer term protect the, 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 the vision or even, uh, you know, change, change the way that glaucoma um, vision loss progresses. Um, and this is going to be done uh, in Australia, in, in Melbourne and Adelaide. We're just starting to recruit patients uh, now for this study. Um, it's also being done in Singapore and in Sweden uh, and in uh, London. Um, and so, so we've got a big international collaboration uh, we're going to be recruiting probably a couple of thousand patients between all of the all of the different studies um, that will answer this question. That's just one example, and then we've got a range of other things which I will take great delight in talking to you in more detail about at a, at a future session, looking at how we repair the nerve. And stem cells are one of those um, types of treatment that we're using. And I've done some work showing that this can have an effect in animal models of glaucoma, beneficial effect on. On, on, on vision loss um, and, and we're also using gene therapy. You heard a little bit about gene therapy today for macular degeneration. It's proven to be a very powerful technique potentially for use in, in glaucoma as well. So there's a, a lot, lot going on. Um, some, some things that are pretty easy to test um, but just need us to get on and do like the vitamin B3 and then and some more advanced uh, therapeutics that we're also working on. Um, so lots of things to, to present in future sessions. I think we had a question up the back there. Um, I 
also have glaucoma. And um, my question, though, probably not for Keith, maybe for Peter, I'm very interested in the neurodegenerative aspects of the disease. And right at the beginning of your talk, Peter, it mentioned that you've done some work with Alzheimer's. And I'm, I'd like you to just talk to that a bit, please. Thank you. Um, there are tremendous parallels between um, Alzheimer's and glaucoma. And in fact, um, we know from some studies that in advanced Alzheimer's disease, there are changes in the optic nerve that resemble glaucoma quite closely. Um, and there are some similarities down to the molecular um, basis of both diseases. So it's a very astute question, so thank you. Um, so um, to, to answer the, the work that we're doing in, in Alzheimer's disease, one of the, the huge challenges in this disease, for which we have no real effective treatments, despite knowing about the disease for more than 100 years, is that um, by the time someone de develops dementia, they're already um, well on the road of the disease. It's probably started about 30 years before the onset of memory impairment, so there's this gradual change in the brain. So if we're waiting until someone has memory impairment, it's too late. We, we're not very good at bringing back dead neurons. And so there've been many, many trials that are focused on people who manifest memory impairment or signs of dementia, but it's probably a little bit too late at that stage. You know, you need a wonder drug to make a difference then. But what if we could identify people earlier on, say 10 or 20 years before the onset of memory impairment, we don't need such a wonder drug. All we need to do is sort of change the trajectory of the disease progression slightly to mean that people will um, die of something else, of old age, rather than uh, developing dementia. So that's the audacious goal in Alzheimer's disease, and that's where increasingly Alzheimer's researchers are focusing their effort. Um, but a precondition to that is detecting people at the right time. Um, the way we um, diagnose um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease now is by either using a lumbar puncture, which is a, a spinal tap, so a needle around the spinal cord to sample some fluid which gets sent off to the laboratory. Obviously, not something that we can do at a population level. It's expensive and invasive and not, not particularly nice. And the other test is a PET scan, which is a very um, um, limited and sophisticated um, brain scan where you get a specific radioactive um, tracer injected intravenously that then binds to one of the, the waste products that builds up in the brain in Alzheimer's disease, and then you have a scan. So very few people get access to that. Uh, it's very costly. So we need a way of detecting um, people on a trajectory to Alzheimer's disease. And so that's where we started looking, using this hyperspectral imaging technology to see if we can detect one of those waste products that builds up in the brain also builds up in the retina. And so we were the first group in the world to show that we could apply hyperspectral imaging to detect a signal for amyloid beta, that waste product, um, in, in Alzheimer's disease. So that's really exciting research, which is now um, being rolled out in uh, Belgium and Sweden with our collaborators. We've sent our cameras there, um, and we've uh, been very fortunate to be funded by Bill Gates and, and uh, the EU NH and MRC, so it's really exciting work and um, you know, we'd, we'd love to see it, it get out there. And, and the thing that I find exciting is that, um, that that same camera that can be used to acquire a standard image of the retina to detect um, areas of the retina that are not getting enough blood supply and diabetes could also, through that same image, detect people's risk of Alzheimer's disease. So that's the sort of audacious goal. Um, we are also looking with that technology specifically at glaucoma, so we have a study underway with another researcher at CIRA, um, Z Chao Wu, Associate Professor, um, who is um, very interested in looking at signs of glaucoma damage before the nerves are lost. So when we image people with glaucoma at the moment, we detect the death of neurons. We can't bring them back. So we have some preliminary evidence that we can see a signal of cells that are stressed before they die because they could be rescued. Thank you. And one other aspect to that question is People with glaucoma sometimes ask if that means they're going to be more at risk of Alzheimer's disease in, in, in the future. And the answer is that the association between, even though there are common mechanisms, the association is very weak. Um, and so it, you know, other risk factors for dementia are much more important. Blood pressure, for example, so having high blood pressure is a much, much stronger risk factor for developing dementia. Family history, 
um, how much you use your, 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 your brain in, in later life is actually really important as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a risk factor, much stronger than something like uh, glaucoma. So the upshot of that is that you're all reducing your risk of dementia by being here today. <laughs> Um, we, we, we are reaching the end of question time. Um, we, we'll just ha have one more question and then um, out to lunch. Thank you very much. A fascinating discussion by all participants. It's been much appreciated and eye-opening, if I may use that expression. Um, one of the things that I've observed about the medical practice is they're very conservative folks in general. And I'm wondering how, what steps CIRA is taking to distribute and and take that information, the new studies, the new, the new ways of doing things and moving that out into the wider medical community so that your, your groups of people that are in your trials and are benefiting from the research are better able to uh, access the, the fruits of your research. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and um, answer that question. Certainly, look, you know, we all... We all uh, basically um, disseminate the results of our research uh, through a lot of scientific congresses, not just uh, nationally, but also internationally as well. Uh, we've actually just had our national uh, congress recently where all of us have actually been talking about the trials and the, the results of our trials um, to our colleagues in ophthalmology. Uh, we also do the same internationally, as I said before, but we also let them all know about the trials that we're recruiting to. It's also a really good forum or an opportunity to actually meet with fellow researchers or fellow clinicians to really talk about building uh, collaborations for research and getting them involved in recruitment or even seeing some of our patients in the clinical trials as well. So certainly this is something that we all do. Um, on a very regular basis and certainly much easier now that, um, you know, the, all the lockdowns and all the international restrictions and travel have also reduced because I'm sure all of you know that it's so much nicer to meet and talk in person than it is over a Zoom screen. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I think I'd, I'd add that, that Syria is the place that it is because we have such a rich and committed community of supporters. And I think, you know, um, each of you can, can spread the word about CIRA and, and, and the research that we do and the importance of our research and, and, um, you know, and don't underestimate the, the value of that. So I think you know, our, we get the message out through our community as well and I have to acknowledge our communications team, Janine's there at the back, who's just done an absolutely stellar job in communicating the message of research and the importance of that in a very approachable uh, and, and real and meaningful way. So I hope you find those communications of value to you. And, and we talked about us communicating the results to, to physicians, but actually very often it comes from patients. So patients um, inform patients uh, who read the, you know, the reports of new science coming through will often challenge their doctor and say, well, is this, what about this for me? You know, and that stimulates the doctor then to go and find out a bit more because they don't necessarily know some of these things. So, so it's, it's, it's a pincer movement, you know, if you like, from, from us trying to uh, educate our, our colleagues on the new things coming through and, and, and patients actually pushing their um, physicians for access to, to, to new treatments. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. We're, we're just thrilled by your interest in, in what we do and for your support. Um, we, if you've got some un unanswered questions, we'll be um, out with you at lunchtime. Um, lunch is just in the foyer outside uh, and it will be available for you to enjoy uh, until quarter to one. And once you've finished, you're welcome to go and have a look at the museum and, and enjoy the afternoon. Um, again, thank you all for attending and showing your support for CIRA. Community events like this are just so integral to what we do and we really appreciate your interest. Thank you.